Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Energy Utilities and Telecommunications Committee on today's date, which is February 15th. I got says those are the minutes. February 16th. I'm sorry. My assistant does such a good job. I'm just not used to that, and, and uh, I get confused. Okay. Since there's no introductions anymore, we'll go right to business. Approval of the minutes from February 11th. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Motion by Deborah Dang. Seconded by Gartner. All those in favor, say aye. aye. All those opposed, same sign. Okay, moving on. Approved. Next, we're going to continuation the hearing on 2180, requiring charges to, charges to electric rates for transmission costs to be approved through the electrical utility general rate case proceedings. Advisor, would you give us a quick overview real quick, please? And I think we've already had one, but just, just an overview to the committee so they all know where we're on. Certainly, Mr. Chair. Um, this is Nick Myers with the Revisor's Office. Yeah, committee, um, last week we ended on this bill. <coughs> Excuse me. House Bill <coughs> 2180, uh, as the Chair said, uh, relates to transmission-related costs and the transmission delivery charges that utilities assess. Again, these are uh, separate charges on customer utility bills. Um, and what this bill would do is would provide that a utility could not use a transmission delivery charge to recover transmission related costs unless such utility already has one established. It also sets out two ways in which the utility could change its transmission delivery charge. So first it could file an application with the KCC for a general retail rate proceeding to change the, the TDC. And then secondly, a utility could change its transmission delivery charge pursuant to an order of a regulatory authority having jurisdiction over transmission matters. So that's like a, an order coming down from FERC. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chair. Any questions for Nick? Seeing none, we'll move on. We have the opponents in oral today. Here in person is Darren Ives with Evergy. Darren, are you here? Welcome to the committee. Would you state your name and who you're with for the record, please? Morning, Chairman Seibert, members of the committee. My name is Darren Ives. I am the uh, Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for Evergy. So appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to be here in front of you today and provide our views on this bill. Um, maybe maybe a brief background on on why the TDC is in effect. You know, in the early 2000s, the legislature passed this uh, based on uh, the ability to address concerns in Kansas about the lack of new investment in transmission as well as reliability of the transmission system overall. Um, since that time, there have been investments in that have benefited the state of Kansas both in reliability of service to our rural areas as well as in Wichita. And in, in addition to that, the transmission has, has unlocked the ability for a major new uh, industry in Kansas for wind generation. Um, more directly, our customers have, have benefited large businesses, universities, and residential customers from access to, to the wind energy that's being produced in Kansas. As the revisor mentioned, the TDC, TDC charge in Kansas encompasses changes in the transmission formula rate, which is a mechanism that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has approved to, to, to place changes in transmission costs and rates, which are updated at the federal level on an annual basis. And the TDC is Kansas's mechanism to, to pass along those changes to Kansas customers on an annual basis consistent with that, that FERC approved process. Um, for transparency, the, the TDC is a separate line item on customers' bills. Um, and as I mentioned, it, it changes annually and, and periodically more frequently when, when significant changes arise through the, the, the federal process. You know, th this, this type of mechanism is not unique to Kansas. Um, proponents have, have said that Missouri doesn't have it. Um, but, but there are a number of states listed in my testimony, Texas, Arkansas, South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, many of our regional peers that do have recovery mechanisms in place to address transmission investment. Um, you know, for the reason, as for reasons why the bill makes no sense, um, five of the last six uh, adjustments that we've had in the TDC 
have resulted in decreases. With the mecha mechanism in place, those decreases have gone back to customers, which wouldn't have been the case during this moratorium that we currently have on general rate cases as a result of our merger. Um, you know, there's also the effect of bringing these these costs in on an annual basis addresses lag when there's investment. If 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 there's not an annual recovery mechanism like the TDC, then then the mechanism is as as the proponents propose rate cases. If, if there are investment and changes that need to happen, that can drive more general rate cases in front of the commission. Those rate cases have two real effects. They are costly and time consuming. Uh, they don't fix all of the recovery lag that's there. And ultimately, they can result in larger step changes to, to customers at the time of a rate case when we have investment coming in uh, compared to an, an annual impact that would come through on a mechanism like this during an investment cycle. You know, we, we are in an extremely unprecedented event right now, um, as, as you're all aware, weather events across the entire SPP. Um, transmission has certainly uh, been a support for the ability to get through as well as the region has. Uh, I recognize we are in, in some times right now where we are having some, some rolling effects to customers, but, but we have not had unplanned, sustained long outages in the region. And really, transmission is a piece of that, and transmission is probably going to be a piece for uh, future solutions as we continue to to unravel the events of, of this un unprecedented weather event. Uh, at the core, transmission really is about reliability. Reliability for our customers, as I mentioned, not only in, in our cities, but, but it is the backbone that gets power to all the rural communities that, that we serve in Kansas. Um, without it, our, our, our rural customers won't be able to have the, the access to, to low-priced low energy. Um, proponents bring this bill up in hopes of reducing rates. Um, we've had a lot of discussion about rates in, in the legislature. Um, our, our rates, we, we, we recognize we are continuing to work on them on a regional basis. Um, you've heard testimony and there's been testimony that our, our rates are improving both on a rate average and absolutely on an average bill perspective uh, compared to the region. We recognize there's more work to do um, and, and that's why we have been supportive when bills make sense to reduce rates. Last year, we were supportive of the, the elimination of the pass-through Kansas taxes that, that went to customers' bills. We, we got that passed uh, with the help of, of this committee and others, and, and the proponents, obviously, and we got that implemented. Th this bill does not have those same merits, and, and now is not the time to adjust the mechanism uh, like the TDC. So, so with that, Chairman, I'd, I'd stand for questions. Anybody have any questions? Representative Schreiber. Uh, thank you, Darren. Um, just one quick question. Uh, you took, talked a lot about rate cases and how often they are filed. I know Average is in a rate moratorium right now, but typically how often would you file a rate case? We would like to be in the range of, uh, you know, the four to five year window, five years, our moratorium. Um, it's a little dependent on facts and circumstances and, and investments that, that need to be made for re reliability of the system and, and benefit to customers. But, but we'd like to be at four to five. Um, it, it has certainly helped um, when we have mechanisms like the TDC and the fuel clause that allow for some of those those larger costs that are that are a little bit less in our control in some cases uh, to be handled through those versus having to come in for a rate case for sure. Any other questions, Representative Turner? Yes, I know. I read, <clears throat> excuse me, somewhere in testimony that uh, I wasn't back in '03 when they passed this that it was intended to build out transmission and that that's that's run its course now. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so I wouldn't say it's run its course. I would say we've had uh, we've had a lot of success in in improving some of the reliability. Um, you, you have heard we're in a workshop right now on our sustainability transformation plan, a, a, a set of workshops with stakeholders in front of the KCC. One of the things that we've talked to stakeholders about is we 
we still have areas of aging infrastructure in our system and transmission is a piece of that. Um, so part of our investment strategy moving forward is to, to refresh that transmission system, make sure we've got the right level of resiliency and reliability in that system. When we do that, we'll also have the ability to add some additional automation, which allows for more real-time switching and, and even, even better automated improvements for reliability. So, so I, I would say it's been helpful, but, but we're, we're not at the finish line yet. Representative Keither. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning on this cold, cold day. I'm waiting. I'm waiting with bated breath to make hope that I don't get kicked off because of a rolling blackout this morning in our area. Um, I just want to make it very clear to, um, that I'm understanding what you're saying. And the the proponents of this bill think it's necessary to go forward. And what I'm hearing from you is that if we adopt this bill that it's going to create more rate cases, which in turn then passes the cost to the consumer. So this is not making any sense to me if we go forward with this bill. I mean, I, to, to me, it's defeating the purpose of what they're trying to do. Am I correct in how I'm reading this? I, I, I agree. I agree with that representative. And that that's why we're opposed to this bill. We. We, we are all for looking for continued solutions, but but we don't think this is the right one. We think it'll be a step backwards. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? Representative Turner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, another question that I see brought up is the transparency factor. So they're saying when there's a uh, general rate case, of course, there's public hearings and uh, could you contrast that to what happens in a FERC rate case? It, for sure. So so if you step back on a FERC rate case a little bit, uh, FERC has a process in place where they have approved a, a, a template, a formula for, for how you submit your cost updates that come in. Um, they also approve with that a set of protocols that, that once that template is populated, then you work with, with stakeholders in that FERC process to answer discovery and data requests and inquiry for them to get comfortable that you've populated that form with the appropriate cost. Um, so there, there's a process there as well. And then when you move to the TDC, we do make a TDC filing. And, and I think you'll hear from, from the staff today, but, but the staff also has visibility into the components of that filing and certainly has the opportunity to, to raise questions on, on the costs that are included in the TDC as well. Um, in addition to that, from a transparency, I mentioned it does show up as a line item on, on customers' bills so they understand kind of specifically what we're spending for the transmission component of the system. And we've heard a lot about the size of it, and transmission is a big part of our business. But, but right now, I would say the, the impact of a TDC on our average residential customer bill, I, I would, our average residential bill is about $114 a month and $14 of that is the TDC that they would see on their bill. So it's sizable, um, but, but it's $14 that, that's visible to them, understanding that that's, that's creating a reliable backbone of the system to, to, to get them energy. Seeing none others, any, any? Okay, thank you, sir, for coming to us. Uh, Representative Turner, if you'd like to move up to this empty position on the horseshoe, you can. Yeah, I know. That's why I feel bad for you back there. And then that way, some of the participants can sit in those chairs and get your social distancing done since there's nobody back there. So, okay. Thank you, Darren. Next on the list is Whitney Dameron, Liberty Utilities Empire District. Whitney, please come forward and state your name and who you're with for the record, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Whitney Dameron representing uh, Liberty Utilities. Uh, Liberty is one of two investor-owned electric uh, utilities operating in the state of Kansas. We're uh, substantially smaller than the footprint that Evergy has. Uh, Liberty Central Division has uh, assets in six states. They're in the electric, gas, water, and, and, and wastewater uh, with uh, uh, various areas of uh, six, six states in the Midwest. We have about 10,000 customers in, in the very tip of southeast Kansas. Appreciate the opportunity to testify on this. Uh, Evergy is, is obviously covered 
the majority of the issues that, that Liberty has been concerned with. If you look at these kinds of kinds of riders that that are put in place over the years, you know, I, I think it's been kind of through discussions, negotiations between utilities and the regulators and staff uh, of issues that are, I wouldn't say automatic, but but practically routine when you come to a rate case. So you show up these costs at a rate case. Yeah, okay, set those aside. We agree those were prudently made and, and you know, with, with some kind of review. And so that's where the KCC and, 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 and staff and, and the utilities have looked at these kinds of riders and said, okay, that makes sense. Um, we're not going to fight over that when we have a rate case down the road. Um, there is something um, in the rate making process called regulatory lag that creates a tension between the utility uh, and the bill that ends up down to the customer. Uh, and that is, we're going to make you utility toll these costs and carry them for a number of years so that you'll keep costs down um, because you're not getting recovery on them. And then that eventually forces a utility to say, we're carrying all these costs. We've got these investments. We need to get them recovered. We need to get them into rates. They go in and file a rate case. And so as Representative Keither noted, um, these kinds of things, whether it's cost of gas, you know, on a natural gas bill or, or things that are considered routine adjustments are taken into consideration. And that's why you have something like a TDC. So we believe they're appropriate. It also helps um, if, if that's important to members of this committee, the, the people who are benefiting from that asset are paying for it. So the people who are benefiting from transmission being uh, used and useful, poles up, line strung, and moving power back and forth, the benefiting from that, they're the ones who get to pay for it, as opposed to we'll push this down the road two, three, four, five years when we have a rate case and then go back and try to recover uh, after that asset's been in the ground and, and been being used for a number of years. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, happy to stand for questions. Appreciate the time. And um, we've objected to uh, this legislation in the past and object to it today as well. And we don't think it's uh, necessary. Thank you, Whitney. Any questions for Whitney? Representative Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, I, I read in all the testimony about the costly rate rate case process. What, what, um, how would you contrast the cost of a general rate case versus recovery through FERC? Maybe just an order of magnitude. I don't. I'm obviously not dollars and cents, but oh, the, if you look at something the size of an energy rate case, it could be substantial. If you look at for example, my, my client, Liberty, in six states, if they do a rate case, they might have to do a rate case in six different states. And uh, utility lawyers charge even more than I do, um, but, uh, <laughs> as I think Evergy would agree. But uh, I wish I could get to that level, but I haven't yet. Uh, they can be substantial, and, and, and uh, you know, there's tension in, in the regulatory process for that, too, of, of pushback from regulators and staff on on rate cases because of those costs. And it depends on, you know, quite frankly, the investments being made by the utility and, and what they're having to seek recovery for as to uh, what kind of experts they have to hire. Uh, outside consultants come in. The state has to, to hire consultants as well. Uh, and typically those costs are then put back upon the rate payer. Very good. Yeah, I guess I was just, you know, I see in your testimony you talk about costly general rate case. I'm just was looking for something to give the committee an idea of how to weigh that criteria when we look at the costly fact, the cost factor of a of recovery one method versus the other. And that's really what the basis of my question was. Thank you. I'd be happy to find additional information from the client and bring them to you. Seeing none on the screen here. Uh, any other questions of the committee? Seeing none, Whitney, thank you. Thank you. That closes the written, our, our opponents, oral opponents. We'll move to the written. Uh, Leslie Kaufman, Cast Electric Co-op. I think everybody knows Leslie, if you'd make sure they know who you are. If anybody has any questions, you can get with Leslie, I'm sure, anytime. That closes the written. Don't see, is there any other people that would like to speak to this as an opponent? Seeing none, we're going to move to the neutral section of the bill. Neutral is Justin Grady, Chief Revenue Requirements, 
for the Kansas Corporation Commission. Justin, are you here? Um, good morning, Chair Seward. I'm, I'm online this morning. Um, good morning. Yeah, uh, do me a favor, and if my audio in the committee room there um, starts to get garbled at all, please interrupt me and I'll shut my video off so that it remains clear. Okay, can you state your name and who are you with for the record, please? Absolutely. So my name is Justin Grady. I'm, I'm Chief of Revenue Requirements, Cost of Service, and Finance for the Kansas Corporation Commission. I work in the Utilities Division. Um, my, my written testimony that the committee has is marked as neutral, but um, we did our best this morning to inform the, the utility, uh, the, the committee assistant, that we'd like to change that, that position to opposed this morning. Um, the, the, the words in my written testimony, most of them are, are still accurate. There's some information there. That testimony was, was basically our position was, um, you know, this is a policy decision for the legislature. This body created 661287. If it's the will to, to change the incentive uh, structure and require the utility to carry those costs longer in between rate cases than you know, we're not going to take sides necessarily, but we provided some concerns and some additional information for the committee. Um, as I was preparing for this testimony this morning, in the midst of uh, rolling blackouts that are initiated by SPP across the 14 state region, uh, in order to prevent a, a more catastrophic reduction, you know, um, loss of, of power and reliability, closer to, to be honest, compared to what ERCOT is dealing with. Um, I, 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 I informed, we had internal discussions and then did my best to inform everybody that I could that I'm now opposed to this testimony, or I'm sorry, I'm now opposed to this bill. Um, it, it's a little too early to tell exactly what all of the confluence of events that we've experienced that have led us to a situation where we are now curtailing load throughout throughout SPP, but um, there are certain to be uh, investigations and changes in energy policy, both Kansas uh, throughout the SPP region and nationally. And um, those changes could call for additional interregional transmission development. They could call for strengthening transmission grid within Kansas or within SPP. Uh, they could call for an even further diversification of our energy sources and our, our sources of supply. And with that much uncertainty on the lands in the landscape, the policy landscape, uh, our KCC staff's position at this point is that to change the, the transmission delivery charge bill in this fashion, focusing so singularly on the issue of economics, and um, bill stability for maybe another couple of years, we think that that's, that would be short-sighted at this point and, and likely premature um, given, given the, the, the newfound situation that we found, find ourselves in. Um, if uh, there's just a few other things uh, that are in my written testimony, I'll quickly call the committee to, there was a lot of testimony last week uh, regarding how transmission charges have changed and and that's true, but of, but of course, Representative Schreiber pointed out that AECOM found that transmission delivery charges and, and fuel costs and, and uh, wholesale market prices tend to be inversely related to one another. Um, the other thing is, as we are currently investigating ST, uh, Evergy's STP plan right now, their sustainability transformation plan. But one of the public elements of that plan is that they're projecting a reduction of fuel and personal car $145 million from 2019 to 2024 levels. Now, of course, they also project this in transmission time and transmission development. And, and those two things are not, uh, it's not a coincidence that, that those, those charges are moving in opposite directions. So changes in fuel and purchase power, of course, flow through directly to customers on a monthly basis. And so there's a real question, I think, of fairness and equity um, with, in, in whether or not this bill would be balanced if you require the utility to carry certain cost increases over time, but then allow them, require them to, to, uh, 
to pass through immediately reductions in those expenses. Can I interrupt uh, for a second there? Absolutely, you're, sir. You're getting a little choppy, so if you could cut your video, I think it'll come in a little. Thank you, sir. I will never um, hesitate to take an opportunity to stop my video on one of these things. Thank you for interrupting me. Um, so one last quick thing, and I'll, I'll just read um, from a statement that we received from SPP this morning, specifically directing the curtailments that, that are experienced, that we're experiencing throughout the region right now. So there, there's, there's additional background, but then just a few sentences here. It says, we were forced to issue an EEA-3 again this morning at 6.15 a.m. At 6.46 a.m. this morning, we directed a total of 1,500 megawatts of firm curtailments, followed by another 1,500 megawatts of firm curtailments at 7.18 a.m. This total of 3,000 megawatts of curtailments includes 2,700 megawatts of SPP load interruptions and another 300 megawatts of firm export curtailments. These actions were precipitated by loss of imports curtailed due to extreme transmission loading conditions on the MISO system. In addition to our own transmission loading issues, morning load picking up and the lack of sufficient generation. SPP has experienced extreme transmission loading events throughout parts of its system throughout the night last night and again this morning. Extreme loading in the southern part of our footprint has required additional curtailments to ERCOT. And so, that's transmission is, is one component of this, but that's, that's as real, real world and real time information as I can provide the committee that um, it might not be the best time to, to, to make a, a singular sort of piecemeal policy change like this to, to Kansas energy uh, policy and energy legislation. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this morning. Committee, I'm sorry that um, my, my audio was choppy coming into the committee room, and I certainly stand ready and willing to answer any questions that the committee might have. Representative Keither. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Justin. Um, that last part of your testimony sort of said chills, if <clears throat> you'll pardon the expression, up my spine. Um, just very, in the briefest way you can possibly imagine, uh, can you explain to the newer members of the committee what MISO and ERCOT and are because that's huge. I mean, you know, to understand that other regional transmission organizations are ha having such a big impact on our own, uh, it, it just paints a bigger picture. And I wanna make sure that, the, that, that that's understood. Absolutely, I'll do my best uh, representative. So, so SPP is a, is a regional transmission organization, 14 state. Uh, currently, there are three other states that have expressed interest in, in joining uh, utilities that are within those states. But SPP's job is to, to operate the transmission system regionally, to, to maintain reliability, and, and to economically move power around that, that uh, region to the extent possible, um, which is all enabled by additional, by transmission. MISO is a Midwest integrated system operator. They're basically the SPP to, to our east, of our east. And, and ERCOT is its own um, separate uh, integrated marketplace, uh, wholesale marketplace and transmission grid operator in, in parts of Texas, in the parts of Texas that have elected for uh, retail choice. Um, the what, what you saw there was throughout this event, SPP, there were there were times where SPP really benefited in from bringing power in from outside of the region. I read this morning um, an email from from an SPP uh, executive that that bringing power in for, through the Western interconnects and actually from Canada really helped during this time. And I know that um, when we experienced rolling blackouts yesterday morning, that was pre specifically precipitated by we were doing okay as long as we were able to bring in power through through some key places from MISO where it's not as cold, you know, frankly, just just 100 miles or 200 miles east of here, it's not quite as cold. And, and there were 
there were trans, trans there were power imports coming in from MISO that really helped. But when those power imports became unavailable, in part due to transmission loading issues, uh, that's when SPP was forced to 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 call on its its rolling blackouts. Uh, now, for context, quickly, um, yesterday we SPP was forced to shed 641 megawatts of of load throughout the 14 state region. This morning, it's uh, the, the numbers that I just read you were, were up to 3,000 megawatts. It's obviously highly dynamic. They were originally uh, planning their peak this morning at 9 a.m. Uh, the good news is the conservation message is helping. It's getting out. Their peak was 2,000 megawatts less than they than they thought yesterday. And so, but to put that in context, if to, to the extent the members of the committee are aware, it's national news at this point. There are millions of people without power in ERCOT in Texas. Uh, I followed that situation very closely yesterday. They had cascading generation outages in which they lost 10,000 megawatts of power in a very short period of time. They were originally forecasting the highest peak in ERCOT the highest uh, system peak winter or summer that they had ever uh, that they had ever achieved, ever reached. And when I looked this morning at, at 530, they were they were 30,000 megawatts short of that original peak. OK, so to put that into perspective, the largest coal fire generation facility in Kansas is Jeffrey Energy Center. That's twenty one hundred megawatts. Right, so we're talking about 15 of those coal plants that they were short of power this morning. So it truly is an unprecedented situation. It's region wide, much bigger than even SPP. Um, but so th thank you for the opportunity to provide that additional context. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think um, that puts a lot of things into perspective and, and uh, Truly, um, I appreciate you changing your your position to opponent because uh, these piecemeal pieces of legislation certainly do more harm than good to our system overall and to our ratepayers. I believe, so I certainly believe in good rate cases. I mean, you know, and get, and getting in there and fighting it out. But uh, I don't think this is the path we want to go on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Delperday. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Justin, appreciate your testimony. Um, listening with intrigue here. Uh, hope we're not deviating too far from the bill, but I'm. I guess I'm asking: Can you, as this, as the investigations proceed, I would love to hear a follow-up from you, whether it's in writing or testimony or something. There. Also concerned with. Uh, uh, we're listening about how coal is is covering a lot of this. We've got nuclear. We've got natural gas. But what's What's happening with the wind and solar as we get into these extreme cold weathers here? Um, I just I just like to know what we've got going forward more than anything. So uh, I was going to ask you about the MISO, but you already hit on that. So I appreciate that. But if you could get a follow up, I, I would appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely, Representative. So one thing that's certain is this event. Um, I believe this event will be uh, discussed and investigated and referred back to hopefully for the rest of my career and hopefully it's the worst one that, that we we'll ever experience. Um, I know for certain there will be NERC and FERC investigations and it, we, will, uh, it's, we will know in, in very significant detail what the, what the confluence of events have been that have caused us to be where we are. Uh, some anecdotal information that I have at this point, um, we, we heard earlier on that there were wind turbine freezing issues. Uh, we heard that there were some uh, generator lead lines or transmission lines leading to those, those uh, wind farms that went out of service. And, and normally when you get those back into service, it's, it's maybe not the end of the world, but in these kind of temperatures, you had lubricants and uh, and fluids that needed to be warmed up, and that took time. Um, you know, in these kind of cold temperatures, our natural gas plants in Kansas, we it gets this cold not very often, but it gets this cold sometimes in Kansas, but not for this long, right? And so, 
we, I, I think there's been sort of catastrophic, much, much worse failure of natural gas plants the further south in our, in, in, um, in the United States that you go, because there, there are a lot of gas plants that were built basically outside um, because in, in, in historically, those plants are called on worse it, or they're, they're most uh, during the, during the heat, the, the grid loading times during our peak load times during the, during the summer. But in any case, we have had natural gas plants freeze. I know, I know there's been, um, it's just extremely difficult on, on uh, equipment to run this long, this hard in these kind of temperatures. Uh, there have been coal piles uh, freezing. I know that's been an issue. And so it's, it's just such a delicate balance to keep all of this equipment operating in, in, in it at its peak during such truly unprecedented times like we're in, in terms of demand. Um, another issue I, I, I think is just the fact that with it being as cold as it is for as long as it has been, um, the, there's, there's true competition for available natural gas molecules between local distribution utilities that are attempting to deliver those, those molecules to customers so that they can use them to heat their homes versus um, electric generation companies that need them to, to produce as fuel to produce electricity. And so uh, it's just sort of the, the, a perfect storm from, from all angles, honestly, but um, you know, certainly we'll, there will be additional information provided, additional um, discussion in the days to come and, and probably the years to come. Do you have any other questions? Representative Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Say, I was wondering, I see brought out in testimony that the, uh, that the FERC allows a higher return on equity than does the KCC and its rate making. Could you comment on that? Absolutely. So currently, um, FERC, FERC does allow a higher return on equity on average or in general. Um, they, they are under a mandate from Congress uh, dating back to the days of the Energy Policy Act of 2005. They're under a mandate to incentivize the production and the development of additional transmission facilities throughout the country. And, and they they would tell you that they're fulfilling that mandate. Um, Evergy Kansas Central, their, their current return on equity in that transmission formula rate that Mr. Ives referenced is 9.8%. Uh, but then they add, they get to add an extra 50 basis points of an adder. Uh, in other words, half of a percentage point for an adder because they're a member of a regional transmission organization. And so, um, they actually earn a return of 10.3% on those transmission assets at FERC. Um, now the, the, the language in the current version of the 661237, as well as um, the proposed bill that we're talking about right now, requires the KCC to conclusively presume those charges to be prudent. What that means is we do our review and, um, and are involved in the regulatory review process at FERC. But once those charges are turned into a transmission delivery charge, uh, basically at that point, it's more of a traditional audit in which we're uh, evaluating invoices and, and verifying that they actually have incurred those costs and that retail customers aren't paying more than their fair share. But at the end of the day, um, that's, that's the, that's the parameters. That's that's the comparison. Uh, by for comparison, Evergy Kansas Central earns a 9.3 percent return on equity, or the, I say they earn it. They have the opportunity. They are authorized to earn up to that in Kansas. Um, you know, it, it's been pointed out in the other uh, independent rate studies. Uh, a 9.3 percent return when it was set was one of the the bottom five or 10 lowest return on equities in the country. Um, it still is very low, but there are some states around us that um, 
that followed suit after we after the KCC set that return at where it did. Uh, but in any case, that's that's the comparison between KCC rate making returns and, and FERC. Representative Schreiber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Justin. Uh, quick question, Justin. Over the last 10 or 15 years, what's been the trend in FERC ROEs uh, in this area? Uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, the FERC ROE history is so confusing that I literally don't even try to remember it anymore. I mean, I did at one point, and I have a file, but it is unbelievable. But the um, there have been complaints filed um, by by a lot of entities. So the KCC uh, filed a complaint against Evergy Kansas Central's return on equity at FERC in 2014. I believe that still today is, is the only regulatory utility commission to file a complaint on, against a retail utility. Um, there, are, there have been other PUCs that have joined in with much larger groups, but in any case, that, that resulted in a settlement and, um, and we agreed with Westar, or Ever, Westar at the time to that 9.8% uh, return on equity. That, that too, that was one of the lowest ROEs in, in the entire SPP at the time. Uh, it still is relatively low, but there are, there, there are cases that were being litigated at the time we settled that case that are still being litigated today. And the, every time FERC issues a decision, it gets um, appealed up to the, the Court of Appeals, the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, and it gets pushed back down to FERC. And so MISO has a system-wide uh, return on equity, and I honestly can't remember the number anymore, but I think it came out recently at 10.03. It used to be up in the 12% range. Um, the, 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 the ROEs are trending down over the 10, last 10 to 15 years, uh, along with the, the general reductions in the cost of capital throughout the financial markets. Okay. Uh, thank you, Justin. That's what I was uh, remembering was it's kind of trended down from the double digits to the single digits now. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other questions? I have actually three that have texted me to question. One of them is, uh, is there any way that folks can see where the blackouts are going to end up? So if like a veterinary doing surgery or critical or doctors or small offices before they get cut off, how are you going to handle that? Or is there somebody that could answer that question? Yeah, I would defer to Mr. Ives um, at, at this point. And then if there's anything I can add, please mention. Oh, I have some questions for you too. Yeah, so again, this is Darren Ives, uh, Vice President of Regulatory for uh, Evergy. Um, the, the short answer is that there, there is not a lot of preview to the outages. Um, when, when we get a directive from SPP, it has been pretty immediate to, to implement and start to move those. We do identify the, the circuits that we can combine in order to to, to meet the, the load obligations to SPP, the load shedding obligations. And we're doing it across our system to try and distribute it and balance the impacts on our system as well. Because we can't, we can't load shed in, in a concentrated basis without creating system impacts within our own system. So we are spreading it out and we are still working our best efforts to rotate it at a 30 minute to, to an hour increment. Um, our, our first step has been to prioritize trying to stay away from hospitals, to, to stay away from circuits that we know have uh, COVID vaccine at them uh, so that we, we can attempt to preserve some of those areas. But, but beyond that, we, we don't have the, the visibility or the time to, to, to carve out a bunch of, of other folks. Would this, would this have any impact because that's a question a lot of people are asking me i spent a lot of time over the weekend trying to answer these questions 
with the smart meters where you can shut them off and on, will that be part of this program where you can turn it off? Because how do you keep a hospital or a veterinary clinic or a pharmacy in town um, from getting cut off with the other people? And that's the question. Yeah, so, so, it's, so it's, a, it, it's, it's a little bit automated on, on the east side of our, our operation. Uh, there is other than Kansas Central where we have tags on hospitals so that we can identify the circuits they're on and, and we can stay away from those. We've put that same process in manually on the Kansas Central side over the weekend in anticipation of this so that we could have that same visibility to circuits that hospitals are on. Also been contacting all the areas that you would expect that have COVID vaccination on site so we understand where those are and we can we can manually flag and stay away from those circuits. But but it is it has been a little bit more difficult when you start to move down to the next level of veterinarians and, and, and things like that where we, we've had difficulty separating out circuits. And, and still meeting our obligations that SPP is calling on. Okay, thank you. Did you have a question for, okay, Representative Delper Dang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, back, years back in my career, I worked for, we'll just say certain entities that we had, I believe, agreements with the power companies because with what we were doing, they were fully backed up with generators. And if they needed rolling outages, we actually said, you can hit us because it's going to be irrelevant. The generators come on and we're good. Does that still exist or should it exist? Absolutely it does. And that, that, was, that was the stage that we started really executing on when SPP got to their EEA level one. We started talking to folks that had backup generation and getting them to, to deploy that. We, we have some large customers that, that we have agreements with for for for, be, for them to be interruptible for certain stretches, and we have we have executed on all those before we got to the SPP EA level three. So so all that was deployed, uh, and that along with the conservation efforts that that certainly we've communicated a lot about, and everybody is doing a great job of helping with, um, helped, but but still didn't get us where we needed to be at the SPP regional level, which took us to the to the rolling blackout phase. Are there very, I'm, I'm, I assume from customer to customer, are there agreements where I can have permission to have you down for an hour versus two hours, five hours? Is that? Yeah, yeah it's, it, it is a little bit different depending on generation. And you also have some of the same issues that we have, right? I mean, we ask people to pull up backup generation. That equipment may be iced up, may not be working. It may only have a certain level of fuel supply available to their generator. Um, so, so that all all has an impact and kind of requires you kind of continual real time discussion with them, so people can give us everything they have. Um, but, but at the same time, and you, we talk about the interruptible customers. I mean, some of those folks have equipment that if it's interrupted for too long or too significantly, it, it can cause millions of dollars of damage to their equipment and long term viability. So, so we're we're working through those kind of on a a case by case basis. Thank you. Thank you. And now I have questions for uh, uh, Justin again. Thank you for answering those. Thank you. Yeah, Representative, I'm on. I, I or sorry, uh, Chair, Chairperson, I'm on. I just shut my video off. So oh, no, no, my no problem. Um, you mentioned that 20 to 30,000 megawatts of electricity are shut down. I've been working in the utility business since I was 19 years old and for all that time until this year, correct me if I'm wrong, the only time I've ever seen interruptions in any type of service was when the lines were torn down by storms. Where, where was the loss of 20,000 megawatts of generation when we're supposed to have baseload generation to back up the system? That, that's the one I'm struggling with myself. Why are we down 20,000 megawatts of generation? So, Chair, Chairman uh, Seiward, I'm, it, I'm sorry if I was unclear. Um, I, that was, I was referring to the situation in, in ERCOT. And so, um, in, in SPP, our situation isn't anywhere uh, near that dire at this point. Um, the last notification that I saw, which was right before I, I got on this hearing, um, they were looking at at 3,000 megawatts of, um, of 
rolling blackouts of curtailments. Um, from what I understand occurred in ERCOT is, uh, and, I, and I don't know a lot, I'm, I'm just reading their press releases and, and their information, but within the, the power grid of Texas, I, I think they had, they had generators tripping offline, um, especially overnight, not last night, but the night before, which, which led to their original cascading issues. Um, and I think that was due to the fact that those generators are, are sim simply dealing with uh, Arctic temperatures that they have never experienced before. And, and a prolonged period of time of cold weather that they've never experienced before. And they just simply were not designed um, for, for the kind of conditions that they're being exposed to. Uh, again, that's that's all preliminary at this point, but, um, and then your, your question is appropriate in terms of baseload power. Um, I mean, th throughout SPP, you know, in Kansas, Evergy went into this, um, this event having around 24 percent operating reserves darren mr ives could 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 clarify that more specifically each utility in spp is required to hold 12 percent operating reserves and and so you know that they've been under a lot of fire recently uh in in front of this committee and others in terms of uh, we need to get that down. We need to look at ways to be more economical. We need to look at ways to 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 reduce that that excess capacity. And so, I I think we were well suited going into this truly unprecedented um, cold cold weather disaster, because the system is holding up as well as it is. Um, now it's that that's not to say that you know, 641 megawatts yesterday of rolling blackouts or up to 3,000 uh, uh, megawatts of rolling blackouts this morning is, is acceptable or uh, to diminish that at all. But it's, but the, the situation that we're dealing with in, in throughout the SPP region is multiple times better than what's occurring right now in ERCOT. And everybody needs to learn and, and, and truly understand and get to the bottom of, of what it is and hopefully uh, make changes in utility planning policy so that going forward, you know, if weather like this happens to be, uh, you know, more the norm going forward, then, then we need to be better prepared. Okay, thank you. It just kind of surprised me that all of a sudden with all this technology and everything that we have, that uh, we failed to provide service. Just real quick, what suggestions do you make to all these people on these rolling blackouts to be out for an hour? How do you keep your house from freezing up if you're total electric? Um, that's that's a good question. My uh, my sister um, was was part of the the rolling blackouts this morning, as well as my mother, um, and so. My understanding is, you know, we're we're hope the everyone's intention is that these are supposed to be 30 to 60 minutes at a time. Um, I personally, where I sit right right here, have not uh, experienced the rolling blackout, but the discussions that I've had with them was that um, there was little to no reduction in in their their temperature. They're they're in their house, um, you know, a few degrees off of the um, off of the thermostat, um, you, you know, the things I've done and I've recommended that my family do is, is try to do the best you can to, uh, to seal up doors and, and windows, put blankets or towels around the bottom of those doors. If there's any cold water coming in, um, I, honestly, if, if we were to go into a, you know, a 24 hour situation without power, at that point, I don't know. I don't know if, if Mr. Ives has any additional uh, better answers for people. I don't know if you can continuously run your water, um, slowly trickle the water to, to help. But I, I think at this point, the, the plan is, as long as it's, it's relatively short in duration, 30 to 60 minute rolling outages, the intention is that that, that preserves the stability of the entire grid such that we can continue to come back up. 
you know, I, I read reports overnight about what happened in Texas and the reason that they still have 2 million people out of power. Uh, you know, they have millions of people out of power for, for longer than 24 hours. And my understanding was um, their grid, their situation was just not stable enough to be able to, to, to rotate outages in the fashion that they had planned for. So far, our system uh, is, is able to do that. And so um, it's unfortunate as it is, it's, uh, it's so far, it's, it's planned and controlled and, and, and it's working. We hope it continues to. Thank you. Uh, we do need to move on, but this is such an interesting, uh, people would like to know because we've never ran into this. And uh, that's why I want to spend a little more time with it, if you don't mind, Representative Charlotte. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am seeing on social media folks in uh, parts of Johnson County that have been down for more than an hour this morning. And the number one thing that I was hearing from everybody is what could we do so that people at least know in advance? We could get a text message. Could we get email notices? The kinds of things that we get when, oh, your power's out or you forgot to pay your bill, that sort of thing. Surely there's some way we could if not now, in the, in the near future, have a way that people could be notified that you're gonna be part of a rolling blackout in an hour. Perhaps you might wanna you know, warm up the house a bit more than you normally do. I keep my house at 68, so telling me to turn it down to 68 did no good. But so when we got nervous yesterday, we said, well, maybe we'll make it 72 for a while because we know our house cools down rather quickly when the heat's off. So that's just a, I don't know if there's an answer, but that's the number one thing I'm hearing from people is, hey, we'll do our part, but you got to tell us. I don't want to hop in the shower and then find out I don't have hot water. My hot water tank requires electricity. So if there's something we could do in that regard. Mr. Ives, welcome. Uh, appreciate you coming back again. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Darren Ives with Evergy. Uh, you know, specific to that question, I, I, I totally agree, Representative. Um, we, we have been putting out communications on, on every media forum that we have. We've been we've circulated emails to all the email contact we have. You know, Facebook uh, press conferences. We had press conferences yesterday. We had one this morning. We had one again at nine. Um, we're, we're talking to folks as, as quickly as we can. I mean, the the directives and the moves from SPP have been incredibly dynamic. And when they ask for them, they they really are instantaneous. I mean, they ask for them because they need them and they need us to get load shed as quickly as possible. Um, I, I, was, I was alerted to that I didn't mention when we talked about the hospitals and, and, and the, uh, the, the, the vaccine locations that we also certainly have a list of, of medical needs customers that, that have um, let us know. Um, we, we've been in constant outreach and contact with that group of folks as well and trying to make sure that, that we're preparing uh, them and, and, and dealing with them as best we can. Um, to the question that, that you had earlier, I think, um, that, that it's so dynamic with the generation and it's not just us, right? I mean, we've, we, we've, had, we've had very good performance from, from our coal fleet, from our nuclear fleet. We, we've had good performance from our natural gas fleet as we've been able to, to, to get enough gas off the pipeline, you heard about the competition for natural gas, and you know the, the prices certainly have been high, and we that has not been a factor. We've been procuring every piece of gas we can get, but but we can't access enough to run all of our gas fleet full out. I did want to address the wind. Um, Mr. Grady mentioned that there had been some icing. There certainly are some issues with the wind turbines that they will trip at certain temperature levels. Uh, it takes manual work to go out there and, and reset those and, and de-ice and get them up. Um, but, but my understanding of SPP yesterday, and, and I know our system itself received about 20% of our energy from wind resources yesterday, um, and, and SPP's indication was wind came in kind of right on their forecast yesterday. So wind is certainly not as robust as it is in certain periods of the year. But, but it is performing, at least it did yesterday, as it, as it was forecasted to and, and in the planning models before the, the, uh, the events of, of load outpacing supply. 
Again, I apologize for deviation off of this hearing, but it is uh, on transmission or not keeping electricity flowing on the grid. Uh, we'll let one more question since this is really a way we can inform our constituents too and whether it's on the transmission or how this is getting around. So one more question and we better move on. Representative Delperding. I appreciate that, Chairman. Um, this is just a what if question. So it's not addressed to you or Evergy or anything, but what if we in Kansas or federally move forward and start shutting down coal plants? So assuming coal plants are not available today, where would we be, what would we be doing right now? What, what would the grid look like? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question and it's all something we're gonna have to continue to evaluate as we come out of an extreme event like this. I mean, the coal plants, uh, you, you heard questions about or, or comments about coal plants uh, icing over and, and causing some, some derates at times in, in the facilities and some of the equipment and, and lines freezing up. And, but, but all that said, um, for the most part, they have been available and they've been producing. Um, I, I think the answer is going to continue to be, and, and, and this is where I personally and I think Evergy has been for a long time, um, it, it, it's a diversification of supply resources. I mean, if you go south, they have an extreme reliance upon natural gas. I, I think you find at certain times when you get natural gas constraints and pricing like, like you have today, that, that that doesn't work out well and, and those units aren't operating as well as they would like. Um, the same probably could be true with any singular concentration. So I think continuing to think about how we can diversify, but still meet some of the overarching sustainability objectives that, that, that many people are driving and pushing towards will, will be a balance we've got to continue to work through and watch for sure. Okay, thank you. And, and hopefully, again, this is part of the discussion on the transmission. So it's probably a unique situation. We had such a widespread deal that hopefully when we do have a problem in the future, they can move that around. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's the neutral testimony. We have one written and David Nickel, Consumer Council with CURB. Uh, I don't it says virtual on here, but I don't know. Is, is Dave on here? I didn't see him. Did you? On my son. Seeing none, we'll close that. And with that, no further questions, we'll close the hearing on 2180. Yeah, that's why I said I didn't. It said maybe he might be virtual since he was going to testify. Just wanted to make sure if he was on there, we didn't come short. Okay, now we're going to open the hearing on 2329, updating. Entities to the who are subject to pipeline safety programs and the state corporation commission and increasing the minimum penalties that will be imposed for safety violations to confirm with federal requirements. Uh, Nick, would you give us an overview of that, please? Certainly, Mr. Chairman. Uh, committee, uh, House Bill 2329 uh, would amend. Uh, two statutes that relate to pipeline safety and the rules and regulations and the penalties that can be assessed by the KCC for violations of pipeline safety uh, rules and regs. Um, so this, this first statute, 661,150, uh, 150, authorizes the KCC to adopt rules and regulations to conform with the Federal Natural Gas Pipeline Safety Act. And it also provides uh, who is, who is subject to those rules and regulations under Kansas law. So what this bill would do is it would add that all operators of gathering lines as defined in uh, a federal regulation, 49 CFR 191.3, would be subject to the KCC's pipeline safety regulations. Uh, additionally, the bill would remove the provision that excludes uh, from regulation pipeline operators uh, who provide natural gas service directly to the ult ultimate consumer if it is for farming and activities related to oil and gas production. Um, House Bill 2039 would also amend uh, the penalty provision in 661-151 uh, to increase the maximum civil penalties. Uh, and this would increase uh, the maximum civil, civil penalty uh, for a single violation uh, for each day from $25,000 up to a maximum of $200,000 and would increase the total maximum penalty in any related series of violations 
uh, that could be assessed from $1 million to $2 million. And Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Nick? Seeing none, go to the proponent section of this hearing. On the list is Leo Hainos with KCC. Leo, welcome to committee. Please state your name and who you represent. Thank you, Chairman Seward. I am Leo Hainos. I'm the Chief Engineer for the Corporation Commission and the Utilities Division. And we're here to support uh, 2329. As a little background, you heard from Nick, um, the Natural Gas Pipeline Safety Act is the uh, U.S. federal law that sets uh, uh, pipeline safety regulations for all pipelines that transport natural gas, which means it affects commerce. The um, federal agency that uh, oversees that is the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. They're known by their acronym FEMSA, and uh, they are our counterparts on the federal side. Part of the uh, Natural Gas Pipeline Safety Act requires or requires the federal government to allow the states to have primacy over intrastate natural gas pipelines, assuming that they take certain certain uh, provisions. And one of those is that you regulate all of the intrastate natural gas pipelines that are that are regulated by the federal government. And the other one is that uh, you uh, represent or you come close to matching the penalty levels that are required by uh, by FEMSA. And to that end, that is what these two bills are really about. Um, in 1993, we ex expanded the uh, our pipeline safety interstate authority over uh, certain types of pipelines, meaning one of them was master meters, which is, you would see in a trailer park, for example. And the other one was uh, lines that connect uh, power plants or connects consumers to... Uh, to transmission pipelines, and, and the common one is going to be from a power plant. For example, the Energy Metro uh, plant over by Gardner has a, a large line that connects directly to the transmission pipelines to that plant. They are a consumer of natural gas. They operate their own pipeline. Therefore, they're subject to pipeline safety regulations. Now, the other part was um, we thought we had jurisdiction over gathering lines, and for years we've inspected those. However, FEMSA required us to do a uh, review of our authority and as our attorneys went through it and, and worked through the language, they came to the conclusion that we did not have it over, over gathering lines. Uh, the U.S. Um, Congress and the reauthorization of the Pipeline Safety Act gave authority to FEMSA, uh, required them to regulate gathering lines uh, back in 2006 and over the years that's still developing to this day, but over the years it's, it's developed into where it looks just at gathering lines that are located in populated areas, and uh, there's about seven of those type of, of uh, operators that are in Kansas. This bill would give us the authority over intrastate pipelines, and it would also remove an exemption that was put in in 1993, where uh, the, the law said that for those consumers that have their own pipeline system that have manufacturing activities related to farming or, or oil and gas, we're not going to be subject to state authority. It does not remove their authority from the federal side because as long as the gas is in transportation, it is still underneath federal oversight. This bill would put those back underneath the, the KCC. So in, in other words, what we're, what we're doing here is trying to take all intrastate natural gas lines subject to pipeline safety and put those underneath Kansas rules and leave all the federal lines, such as uh, Southern Star and uh, Enable, underneath the federal rules. Regarding the penalty uh, amounts, again, FEMSA, uh, as part of the Natural Gas Pipeline Safety Act, requires us to come close to matching their levels of, of maximum penalties. And for that reason, we are also suggesting that that be updated. I think that concludes um, my remarks on this. I would be happy to answer any questions you would have. Any questions? I just got one. It seems like the penalties increased quite significantly as from to $200,000 to $2 million maximum. What, why was that such a huge increase from 20,000, 25,000? Uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that we've, we, are, we had matched FEMSA's uh, penalty levels back in 
uh, the 1990s, around 2000, and we've been slow to bring those up. We, we uh, as, a, as a group, decided not to bring them up to match FEMSA's levels the last time we did this in 2012. Uh, but keeping in mind, it's a maximum penalty level. And um, since the Pipeline Safety Act is asking us to be more representative of those, we, we're going ahead and set the ceilings up next to where they are. The largest fine that uh, KCC has ever imposed on a pipeline safety violation was about $300,000. And in that case, we even um, uh, reworked that to get work done instead of, of having the penalty apply. In other words, we, we had some piping replaced. I ask what that violation was for to make it so high. What was it was for a uh, repeated uh, uh, violation of keeping cathodic protection, electric corrosion protection on your on your pipelines in the city of Independence back in the 1990s. Thank you. Any other questions for Leo? Seeing none, that closes our proponent section of this hearing. Uh, there is a fiscal note included in your deal. Uh, so if you have any questions on the fiscal note, it's in there. On the opponent section, we'll open up the opponents. And there is no opponents written or oral or virtual. So we'll go to the neutral. And uh, the neutral shows none there. So seeing no other questions, we'll close the hearing on 23-29. In the interest of time, and we only have three more sessions left, Again, I hate to always start in a bill that we start in the middle and don't finish, but this one might be rather short too. We have one uh, neutral proponent or neutral person I'd like to get through. But if we could open the hearing on 2367, and that's authorized the State Corporation Commission to regulate certain transmission line wire stringing activities. Nick, would you give us an overview, please? Certainly, Mr. Chair. Um, committee, House Bill 2367 uh, would provide that any entity uh, that is exempt from jurisdiction of the KCC uh, from public utility regulation pursuant to uh, 66104E, it's a specific provision uh, in uh, 66104, uh, these entities would not be exempt from the wire stringing requirements of KSA 66183. So currently, and as I said, a specific provision in 66104E or subsection E, authorizes certain entities to exempt them, their activities and facilities uh, from public utility regulation. And to be exempt, such activities or facilities must relate to the generation, marketing, or sale of electricity from an electric generation facility, or in addition to an electric generation facility that uh, was constructed on or after January 1, 2001, and is not in the rate base of any electric public utility. So what the bill would do again is it would provide that this exemption is not intended to exempt those, those entities from the wire stringing requirements found in 66 one, uh, 183. Um, and I'd be happy to stand for questions, Mr. Chair. Questions for Nick? Representative Delpert, Dang. Thank, thank you, Chair. I don't know if this is a question for you or for Nick, but <clears throat> is this in any way related to the power pole issues down in Wichita, or can it be related to such? I have no idea. You'd have to ask for the reviser on that. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about, Nick? Are, are you referring to uh, maybe those urban electric transmission lines down in Wichita uh, um, that the f there was a floor amendment to do to deal with that a little bit last year. Absolutely. Um, I don't believe that this is uh, this this bill is related to to those that that type of uh, line siding. Okay. Thank you, Representative Schreiber. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, the possibly could be amended on here like it was last year. But on Thursday this week, we'll be hearing a bill related to that because there's been an agreement reached. And so we'll hear, we'll be hearing that specific situation. So thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, there's also a fiscal note included in your report. We'll close the revisors overview. Open proponents, 
First opponent is Leo Hanos with the KCC. Leo, please state your name and your who you represent. Thank you, Chairman Swivert. Again, I am Leo Hanos. I'm the chief engineer for the KCC. So this bill uh, updates or amends uh, 66183, which was enacted in 1917, and I believe it was last amended in 1923. And it deals with uh, regulations and, and safety rules regarding um, electric transmission lines, all electric lines actually, not just transmission lines. Uh, but it applies only to public utilities as it did back in the 1920s. Uh, in 1985 and in 1992, the cooperatives um, were deregulated from being considered as public utilities in Kansas. And, except for one exception in there, well, at least one exception, and that one was that um, uh, the wire stringing rules would still apply to the cooperatives. Uh, wire stringing rules do not apply to municipals or to um, uh, some companies that own their own private lines, which would be like some of the oil field companies that have their own system. Um, and under this provision, it, as, as Nick mentioned, it would apply to the what, were, what are known as generator tie lines. That's really the, the, the crux of this. It would apply to any lines that are attached to, um, to renewable energy or any, any, any generation for that matter that's a merchant generation that uh, runs operating li our lines to uh, connect into the grid. At this time, there are about 400 miles of those lines. They range from, range from uh, 34,000 volts until uh, up to 345,000 volts. So they look just like any other electric tr transmission line, but they're not underneath any type of safety authority or even notification authority for the KCC to know where they are. We do get calls on these. As I mentioned in my testimony, there was an accident that happened, an unfortunate one where uh, a person died. Uh, it could have been related to construction. We don't know, but we got calls on those. More, uh, not tragic, but concerning. There was a farmer down by Pratt that's called us um, about having uh, 670 volts on his electric fence line that was running parallel to a uh, generator tie line. Again, we don't know how it was resolved. We, we did try to give him advice and tried to put him in touch with the uh, wind farm operators as well. Uh, but again, that, that's the type of thing we look at underneath the wire stringing rules. We're trying to see that uh, the construction practices are followed and that they follow the Natural Electric Safety Code, which is a international, or international it's a national code that uh, is uh, put together by you know, engineering uh, associations across the country. And we would enforce that and make sure it's done correctly. The other thing is they would have to tell us where they are. And um, we would have maps that we could identify the owners and operators of the systems. I think that summarizes it. There's more detail in my, my testimony. But I'd be happy to answer any questions you'd have. Any questions for Leo? I remember getting involved in that one down at Pratt, and that was kind of a shocking experience, so to speak. You know, because, really, because uh, it was totally, you know, nobody would accept it. But I, I believe they got that figured out. Okay. Thank you, Leo. Thank you. Next on the list is Lindsay Campbell, Pioneer Electric, and I believe I see her on here. Lindsay? Um, I'm sorry. Oh, Representative Keither, okay. Didn't see your didn't see your hand on the deal here. Representative Keither. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Leo, I do have a question for you. Um uh, the generation tie lines or generation lead lines as they're called are are done privately. Um uh, I have some concerns with the fact that the KCC now wants to get in the midst of private company activities. Um, would you respond to that? I mean, I understand the safety aspect without a doubt, but these are privately funded, privately put down. So now you want, I, I'm, I'm a little lost for uh, understanding uh, a few, a few incidences that have, 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 brought this to cause, I understand that they have their guidelines that they follow. They follow the same guidelines that, that you've talked about, the national guidelines. So um, I'm just a little concerned about you getting in the middle of all this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Certainly, I tried to address that. Uh, first of all, we are not involved in the rate making of those companies or what they do as far as um, 
how how they uh, finance those or how they even operate those, except for the provisions of safety. And the reason it ties back into safety is because it doesn't just affect that private company. It affects the public. It affects the roads that it crosses. It affects other um, electric lines that it crosses as well. Uh, and, and the analogy I would use, Representative Keither, would be on the pipeline safety side. We, we regulate um, any pipeline, not just public utility pipelines, if they present a safety risk to the, to the public generally. Well, yeah, I, question. well, it 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 doesn't doesn't. I mean, um, uh, uh, but I'll I'll let it go. I'll let I'll hear from other people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Leo. Next up, Amy Cam Lindsay Campbell, Pioneer Electric. I believe you're online. Welcome to committee. State your name and who you represent. Uh, we can't hear you. Lindsay, can you hear us? We can see your mouth move, but we can't hear anything. Technicality to, to call you here. Do you have your speaker or my, uh, microphone on? Maybe if you turn off your video, maybe it's, uh, maybe the. It didn't work either. Okay, I'll tell you what, we'll give you a chance to figure that out. We'll move on here real quick. Uh, we're gonna close that temporary for proponents and move to written uh, Joseph Ash I'm not going to say names because everybody gets mad but it's kind of like pronouncing mine curb has written testimony only for a proponent to this bill we we'll temporarily close the proponents section go to opponents seeing none oral or written, we'll close the opponent section. We'll open the neutral part of this hearing. And we have a person, Kimberly Swati, Swati Public Affairs. Kimberly, would you like to just come to the mic, state your name and who you represent? Good morning, Chairman Seiwert and members of the committee. I'm sure hoping that I do not have a clown face as I did put on lipstick before this morning and I put on a mask and heaven help us all. I hope it's okay. <laughs> well, good morning. My name is Kimberly Genscher Swati and I do appear before you on behalf of the Advanced Power Alliance and we're testifying neutral today on House Bill 2367 and we do appreciate the opportunity to provide comments this morning. Uh, the members of the Advanced Power Alliance are include more than 40 developers, owners, operators um, of renewable energy projects, advanced energy projects, um, most of which operate in the state of Kansas. We only have two operating wind farms in the state that are not part of our organization. Um, many of these wind farms do have what's called a generator lead line, and I would... Um, an, a decent analogy would be to think of you know, your, your lamp and an extension cord going to a power outlet. So um, we have our wind farms, and in some cases, they need to create an extension cord to interconnect into the grid. And that's, these are the types of lines that we're talking about right now. So generator lead lines, gen tie lines. Um, these lines, I think it's important for everyone to understand these are not transmission lines. They are different than transmission lines. Um, we are not part of the SPP's OAT, open access tariff, which requires in order to be considered transmission, um, they cannot be discriminatory in power that flows across those lines. So um, the power that flows across our generator lead lines are dedicated from the, the power generated our project and it flows directly onto the transmission grid. Um, if we were ever to attempt to place these lines into the SPP OAT, 
Um, that would require a whole series of SPP generation studies and um, then would also require that um, all different types of power be able to flow uh, from all different literally physical sources and then also generation sources to flow across those lines. So I think that's an important distinction in what we're talking about here. So these lines truly do just connect um, the, the power produced at the facility to the grid. Um, we also, I, I do, this is kind of a good opportunity to talk about the, the distinguishing elements between these Gentile lines and the transmission lines. So there's lots of conversation about um, transmission lines being constructed in the state and what that means for system reliability, but what it also means for the electric rate payers in the state. These Gentile lines are part of the project. These, pro these lines are not studied necessarily by SPP as part of the regional transmission system. Um, we identify them as needing to be constructed in order to get power um, from the facility to the grid. Um, they're all privately funded lines. They are associated solely with the project. And so they are the cost for that transmission or the cost for that generator lead line is embedded in the cost of the project. So Kansas ratepayers don't pay for the cost of that line in the same sense that they pay for the cost of transmission constructed in the state. Now, to be sure, when the project is purchased, embedded in that purchase price is the cost associated with this generator lead line. So I do think there has been some conversation, um, certainly this legislative session thus far, plus in previous sessions about um, transmission and transmission pricing. And so I wanted to take this opportunity to make that distinction. Um, we also don't have the right of eminent domain at all for these assets. So any, any generator lead line that is constructed is constructed um, by way of a private agreement with a willing landowner. And, and it has to be a willing landowner because we do not have the right of eminent domain. So also an important distinction. Um, still built to national electric safety standards. So very important. And many of the counties where we're building wind farms or solar facilities or um, where generator lead lines may cross, the counties themselves have additional codes and construction requirements that we must adhere to. So um, I, I think that that's an important note as well, just to make sure that safety at all levels is being adhered to. Um, we, we don't oppose House Bill 2367. Um, we do recognize, though, that this is kind of the first foray into the conversation about um, you know, what the KCC does and doesn't regulate when it comes to renewable generation assets. And so, you know, we want to be mindful of that. Um, we also um, would like to continue to work very closely with the Kansas Corporation Commission. So would have, would have liked to have had the opportunity to sit down and talk with them prior to crafting this legislation. Um, I mean, me personally, I would have absolutely done whatever I could to find out exactly where every single one of these Gentile lines are how long the lines are, what the voltage was, and provide emergency management or emergency contact information. And um, so, I mean, I commit that to you all uh, going forward that that's a project I can work on and we can make sure that that information is regularly updated. Um, we stand ready and willing to work with, I mean, any entity within the state and the federal organizations to make sure that safety and reliability is always maintained. So we, we certainly don't oppose the project. Um, I do have to note, however, um, that on the, the gas pipeline side, we know that the KCC um, you know, certainly has regulatory authority over many of the gas pipelines, but they don't have necessarily the regulatory authority over um, the lines connecting to the gas fields, which would, this would be kind of similar. And I, we only know that because we have this god-awful looking black pipe sticking out um, of one of our fields, and I would love to have that addressed at some point. <laughs> um, but anyway, and there really isn't an entity that can handle that, but it's also okay. It's not the end of the world and from our perspective. I'm, and I'm not drawing a parallel there as it relates to renewable gen tie lines, but I did just think it was an interesting point. I'm happy to stand for any questions at any time. Any questions for Ms. Swati? I have one quick one when you were saying the lines, and I understand I'm trying to still learn all this stuff too. Yes. We all are, it, <laughs> all the time. The lines you're talking about are the ones that tie to the commercial power to help power the wind towers, right? You're not putting anything back on that line back into the grid, right? 
That's not the line that sends your power out that you generate. Okay, so... Not the ones you're talking about. So think about it this way. So you have a wind... Let, we'll just... For a wind farm. We'll just say for that. For a wind farm. And you have... Um, we'll take the project by our house in Ellsworth. And it's spread out over many miles. And so we have, you know, different... So you have the tower and then you have lines that are underground. And they... Um, we're, those are collector lines. And so they collect all the power coming from all of these different towers and into um, a, a substation, essentially, where the power then gets stepped up. And then from that point, then we may need to build a generator lead line that then connects, connects the power from that substation to the grid. And that lead line may be two miles, it may be five miles. We have some lead lines that are dozens of miles. Sometimes those lines are 34.5 kV, as Mr. Hanos suggested. Sometimes they are high voltage, like true high voltage lines, 230 and 345 kV. It all entirely depends upon the system need. So um, those are the lines we're talking about, those extension cords, not the collector lines amid the project itself. And then not, although they look like the high voltage transmission lines, but we're not talking about the high voltage transmission lines that are officially part of the SPP grid. Think of those as the equivalent of your I-70, I-135. Okay. Any questions? Representative Delper Dang. I appreciate that you asked that question because I'm I too am sitting here a little confused on this bill. So because it talks a lot about telegraph messages and so forth. And I'm thinking, is this part of the SCADA lines, the control and data acquisition of these pipelines, wind farms, et cetera? But now you're talking it's actually a high voltage line. You mentioned 34 kV or higher. So in other words, what is this bill trying to do is really what I'm after. So, and and my apologies, uh, Representative Delperdang, that's that's probably not best um, for me. Um, I think that might be best for the KCC as the, um, the body that requested introduction of the bill. I can just tell you how it would impact us from, you know, from the Advanced Power Alliance and our members. Um, I, I do think there might be some questions, you know, specifically um, uh, about using the definition of transmission when our, these Gen tie lines, by definition of FERC and SPP, are, are not considered transmission. So I think the KCC could probably best speak to that, could probably best speak to intent. Okay, because I'm, I'm still confused whether this is low voltage or high voltage. Is this a control line or is this question, the actual transmission good line? Good question. That's, uh, you know, there was concern about whether, you know, most of the lines between the towers are buried, right? And then yes, you're talking about the ones voltage. that connect to the grid. So maybe Leo can answer that for you, Leo, later, you know. Well, the lines that do connect to the grid, in some instances, can be high voltage lines, anywhere from 34.5 to 345 kV, but they're not. They look like transmission, but they're not transmission lines in the sense that they um, don't allow all, you know, all forms of power to flow across them. The only power that can flow across those lines is the power straight coming straight from that facility. Okay. Does that make sense? Senator Schreiber might have an answer. I think they have, I think the difference trying to describe transmission line, they do have an end user. Uh, they're delivering power to an end user, you know, a utility or so forth, whereas a generator, a tie line is kind of between, in between kind of form for that. So uh, it's, it's not considered transmission because it's not delivering to an end user. I, I guess we're, if, if I may talk, but my confusion stemming here on the, on the bill, you know, except for private usage, any equipment, plant, or generating machinery or any part thereof for the transmission of telephone messages transmission of telegraph messages or, or and it gets into the pipeline use and so forth something that's what i'm thinking is this a SCADA bill it, or is it a that's transmission current, that's current statutory language right it's been in there for decades right and i understand that so, but it's just throwing me for the loop but it, so we are talking high power i understand it's not transmission it's within the facility it's private so it's, what we would be required to provide is um, information on where these lines are located and and some other additional information to the KCC, which is fine. Um, and then um, adherence to national construction and safety standards. That's, I believe, 
and Leo can confirm, I believe that that is the intent of this bill. I don't believe it goes anything beyond that, but specifically for these generator lead lines. Okay, that helps. Appreciate it. Representative Keither. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Kimberly, if I'm understanding you correctly, you have indicated that all this information would easily be given to the KCC if they had simply requested it and it would have been provided by your alliance group, correct? That is a true statement. Well, I think, thank you, Kimberly. I, you know, to me, I, uh, again, um, putting what can be worked out in between two entities or more to put it in statute when it can be done without going in statute seems to make sense to me. Um, but I appreciate the time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. See no other questions. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. Okay, we're going to close the neutral portion and we're going to move back to the proponents. And I believe Lindsay might be available now. Lindsay, are you on the air? Did I hear that real meekly? Well, that's you. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Lindsay, we're running late here. I'm going to close the hearing, but I'll open it back up on Thursday, and you can come, and hopefully you'll have it all worked out by Thursday to be first on the list to finish the testimony on the proponent section of this bill. Did you have a question? Leslie? Chairman would like, and the chairman was willing, we're signed on to the testimony, and I can provide it as well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, if you'd like, or we can try and arrange for Thursday if you'd prefer. Okay, I think I got that, but I didn't quite hear it all. We can be available on Thursday, or I can okay. give it now let's, on, on let's behalf of Let's get with Barbara, and we'll get you on the list Thursday, because sure. then we can continue this hearing on that last two proponents. Okay. I'm, I'm on Lindsay's testimony. I can give Lindsay's testimony oh, today if you'd like. Okay. All right. If you would I'm like sorry. to, that'd be fine. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, Vice Chairman, Ranking Member, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I am Leslie Kaufman and delivering testimony on behalf of Lindsay um, Campbell, Pioneer Electric. Lindsay was slated to um, testify on behalf of Sunflower Electric Power Corporation, Kansas Electric Power Cooperative, KEPCO. Um, our association, KEC, and Pioneer Electric. Um, public utilities, including cooperatives, have the responsibility to maintain and operate our facilities in a safe manner that delivers reliable power to our customers. Like all public utilities, cooperatives take that very seriously. Unfortunate events in 2018 have helped spur the introduction of this legislation, but that um, incident was not um, uh, caused by any cooperative, and um, we are, wanted to make sure that that distinction was, was clearly drawn. It did, however, demonstrate that there is a um, need for greater oversight by the Cor Corporation Commission, and that that oversight is warranted, particularly in terms of construction standards, maintenance requirements, and emergency response for non-public um, utility operators of generation tie lines. Safety of the public, our members, and our employees, and the communities that we serve is of paramount concern. Um, we have um, employees and contractors in state that can deploy readily in times of an emergency situation, and we should expect no less from those companies that operate lines in Kansas. And if you've heard from previous testimony, those lines can be quite large and carry a lot of volts. We believe that 2367, as proposed, allows the KCC to bring generation tie lines at a voltage of 34.5 kV or greater under the wire stringing rules, requiring that owners of generation tie lines um, design and construct those transmission um, lines in accordance with the National Electric Safety Code and their clearance and loading requirements. And we support um, the provisions uh, as a good start. We do think the bill probably does not fully address though, the concerns of ensuring a timely response to operational and or safety emergencies by um, Gentai operators. Therefore, we suggest that there also be a process established for the KCC to verify how owners or operators of lines will respond in emergencies, including coordination with other affected utilities, local emergency management, and law enforcement. 
Additionally, we note that the safety outcomes to be fully maximized under the statutory changes proposed here um, we need to ensure that non-public utility generation tie line operators and owners must fall within the Kansas Administrative Procedures Act fully and the wire stringing um, uh, obligations imposed under NESC requirements, in particular requirements that lines and equipment be inspected in intervals as experience has shown necessary and that the NESC duties, um, general duty provisions um, um, apply. We appreciate the time to uh, uh, visit with you. Um, we certainly can be available now or at a later time to respond to any questions. And if there are questions specific to um, any of the other entities on the on a testimony or Lindsay herself, we, both, we will be glad to coordinate um, getting those answered from the appropriate entities. Thank you, Leslie. Did anybody have any questions on regards to this? Representative Delperdang. Representative Keither. My hand's not up, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I just didn't want to miss you if you didn't get it. I've been really watching <laughs> for it. So, <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Leslie. And if anybody has any questions, I'm sure they can get with you if any have questions, okay? So I think we've covered everything on this hearing for this bill. Did I leave anything out? Did anybody see? I think not. Okay, well, we will close the hearing on 2367. Real quick before we close the, to today's bill or today's uh, meeting, I believe um, Darren might have an update on what's going on. Was he here? Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, Laura Lutz with Evergy. I was just going to give an update as an example of how quickly things can be changing with this event we're experiencing. Um, Darren's on the phone with a colleague back at Evergy, but we had a um, communication from the Southwest Power Pool that told us to go ahead and restore all power. So for the time being, that's a good thing. Um, it could change later today, but for the moment, um, we're working to restore everyone's power that has experienced interruptions from um, the uh, power interruptions. So. Any questions for Leslie or uh, Laura? Laura, Leslie, we've got too many L's around here. Leo, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> One question maybe that you could, whoops, where are you going? <laughs> I don't know if other people have questions, but if there's an emergency and they're out, uh, you might help us come up with kind of a reporting plan for them. I know that you said if, I was reading through some of the material we had that usually if it's an hour, then if you have a problem to call, but you know, so it's kind of a formula that we could maybe tell our constituents what happens if this continues and what to do if they do report it and find out it is not a transmission, but an actual line down because of the storm or something. So they don't sit there and wait for them to get the electricity on and it's not a power generation deal. It's a line problem. So it's just happened in the past. So if you could do that, and maybe get back with us on that. Absolutely, and we always encourage customers to visit our website, evergy.com, and we have 1-800 numbers that they can call to report a power outage um, and just encourage them to keep checking Facebook, other social media sites, um, as we keep trying to keep customers updated. Okay. And, and again, if you had the number, and the same with uh, Ms. Kaufman with the KEC, you know, a lot of the rural customers, again, they're pretty good about not reporting and they understand that the outage might last a while, but just make sure that it isn't a line problem, that they're not sitting there and everybody else is online and they're not. So who to call and what would be the protocol? If we get customers, we could send them that information. Is that Would that be acceptable? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All right. Kimberly, did... you step up to the mic, please? I mean, I know we're kind of running short, but, you know, we don't have more performa today, so. Sure, sorry. Uh, Darren Ives uh, with Evergy, I would just say on top of what Laura said, I mean, we, we do have uh, the authority to bring everybody back up, and we have some isolated instances where, where some equipment is, is not coming back up, and we're, we're, we're getting out and touching those directly. Uh, I, I think Kansas has actually come up 
better than the Missouri side and, and is pretty much fully back up as I understand it right now. I, I had just stepped out to take that call, but um, I hopefully we're through the, uh, the, the peak of SPP today. We'll be back in touch with them to, to see what the evening peak looks like and, and certainly uh, see what tomorrow's plans look like. But our, our indications are the, uh, the load profile looks a little bit better for SPP heading into tomorrow. Hey, great, and appreciate that, and and I do appreciate your updates on on emails or text messages. And again, if if you wouldn't mind, if you could let members of the committee know that if they're going to be a shutdown, then they can relay that information out on maybe social media for you. Also, if you'd like that help, yeah, if that's reasonable to ask. Appreciate all the communications and help getting the message out uh, as many ways as possible. Certainly, is helpful. So so we'll get you the information. And if you want to do that blanket or with the committee as a committee, would you rather not have that information or would you want them to send it to you? Or we could have you email, email Laura if you want to be on that list. Would that work then? That way, if you don't want to be bothered with it, you don't have to be. Okay, we'll go with that. Thank you. Sure. Representative Berkowitz. I can't see you. You have, have to stand up, Kimberly. Sidetracked by the lipstick, yeah, Miss. Well, I know. <laughs> and sorry, Mr. Chairman, on behalf of Kansas Municipal Utilities, in addition to our joint action agencies, Kansas Municipal Energy Agency on the electric side, Kansas Municipal Gas Agency on the natural gas side, we have 118 municipal electric utilities, about 53 municipal gas, natural gas utilities. We are having all of those communications with all of our member cities so they can push all of that information out as well to their customers. Okay. So we'll well, I think it's form. just helpful for us because people that know you're on those committees, they will contact you, and I'm getting a lot of messages, and, and I have no problem referring anything out that you want us to tell, and if you don't want to, that's fine, too. But I think that's just good PR for our business and that stuff. Any other questions before we adjourn? Seeing none, thank you, committee. Um, I did have some mountain lions, some deer sausage, but it's too late. You missed out. Uh, we are adjourned.